Canadians play video games, and after the pandemic era that put adults and kids online so much, gaming reached an even broader audience for fun and learning. That experience revealed both the potential and problems with video games for youth and the rest of us. How can parents, teachers, students, or any gamer keep the good and lose the bad? Let's ask, in San Diego, California, Julia Rivard dexter co-founder and CEO of Shoelace Learning, in Montreal, Quebec, Jeffrey Dervinsky, director of the International Center for Youth Gambling Problems and High-Risk Behaviors at McGill University. And here in our studio, Christopher Alexander, professor of video games at Toronto Metropolitan University. Welcome to you all. Now, just before we start, in the interest of full disclosure, we'd like to remind everyone that TVO is a provider of the province's distance and online learning, not the agenda or the journalism part of the organization, but the ILC, the Independent Learning Center, which has been a distance learning partner with the Ministry of Education for almost 100 years. And with that, let's talk video games. All right, Julia, I'm going to come to you. According to 2020 stats, 61% of Canadians under the age of 65 played video games fairly regularly. If we look closer into that data, that rate was up 89% amongst those between 6 and 17 years old. Set the stage for us. How prominent are video games right now in our culture today? I think it's undeniable they're everywhere. Um, kids are playing them all the time. I have four kids, <laughs> and I think we do quite a good job at our place in regulating video game time, but but it's a great time for them. It's a time for them to engage with their friends. It's a time to learn new skills, and uh, we can't avoid it. It's a new medium. It's an engaging medium. Uh, it motivates kids to push themselves to be better. Uh, so I think it's something that we should really really watch watch for even more and, and figure out how we can leverage uh, to deliver learning and things that are positive for kids. All right, Chris, how about you? Uh, how prominent are video games in our culture today? So um, I would imagine that the stats are fairly high. As you just mentioned, uh, video games are prevalent not only via playing, but also in how they've influenced things like our cell phone UI and the way that people interact, chat, cultural concerts and the like. So they're there. They're there. Uh, a predominant space in our culture right now, I think. All right, and Jeffrey, let's fill out uh, the rest of it. How, how would you say, when we look at video games in our culture today, how prominent is it? That is very prominent. Uh, we know that 98% of young boys are actually playing video games. Uh, and we know that it's been normalized. So it's not atypical. We no longer have to sit at our consoles and play the video games. We go online. We can play them on our smartphones. We can play them on, on our iPads or on our laptops. All right. Chris, in your TED Talk, or your recent TED Talk, you argue that video games can help people tap into and level up the way they learn. Break this down for us. So uh, in the TED Talk, I talk about how video games can cater to human learning, the way that humans engage with in information via audio, text, and video, how they can enhance online instruction. So we've got people that are streaming, and the components of how we stream, how we end up appearing online is a part that can enhance online instruction, and how video games themselves always provide clear objectives and how that would be useful within the context of a classroom. You starting to learn something, knowing exactly where you're going, and then subsequently what the reward will be at the end. All right. Jeffrey, I'm going to come to you. The uh, World Health Organization has recognized gaming addiction as a disorder, and you were on the advising committee for that. What makes this a clinically diagnosed condition? Well, what we've noticed worldwide is there's a growing body of literature, which has not only talked about the positive aspects of video game playing, but also the negative aspects that when individuals become overly involved. Uh, in a study that we did in Ohio, we found that over 60% of young people in high school and in junior high are playing more than two hours a day on their video games. And so this became a real problem because it was interfering with a wide variety of, pro of issues with respect to their socialization, Eating disorders were resulting from this and a wide variety of psychological behaviors. And so as a result, the World Health Organization looked at all the research and decided that they should include it in their ICD-11 as a potential disorder. All right. Julie, I want to get your take, and I'm going to get Chris's take on that as well. 
clinically be or recognized as an addiction. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, first of all, we have to recognize that not all games are created equal. Um, there's a lot of games that give kids experiences that are positive experiences. Um, and I think that there's also the argument, and I know there's a, there's a criticism of the gaming community that this is an argument they always make, but it is also the role of parents to step in and make sure that kids are not engaging too much uh, in screen time generally, um, gaming and additional screen time. I do understand though, it can cross a line. It can cross a line for kids and they can it can turn into addictive behavior and that's a problem. Um, and we have to address it, absolutely. It doesn't mean that we don't use video games uh, for good, um, but I think it is something that we have to get more savvy about as a society, um, as parents, uh, as educators, to make sure that our kids are engaging in healthy screen time. Um, and I, I know there's a way to do that with video games. Chris? So uh, I love the uh, conversation surrounding the potential of the addiction, but I really enjoy the suggestion about parenting. Mm. Now, uh, some of my work delves into um, internet gaming disorder, which affects roughly 0.5 to 1% of the global population. And what we also look at is digital parenting, which refers to parents, for some reason or the other, can't afford to spend time with their kids and as a result are giving them technology as a result. So the question that I think we often should be asking is, who controls access to the video games. And again, as mentioned, all games are not created equal. Which kinds of games are, are creating these kinds of issues that were described by the WHO? All right. I want to play part of your TED Talk. Let's get a roll on that. <laughs> but I'm also using the mechanics of video games to trick students into exploring complex concepts like history, sexism, racism, corporate culture, and tokenism while we play this game together. All right. In that, you're setting up sort of what your, your students and how you sort of teach them uh, sort of the, the other side of video games, not just, you know, points and, 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 and sort of levels and all of that. There's a whole other level to it. Tell us a little bit more about what you're trying to explain. That. So right there, I'm talking about how when we look at things that span outside of just the playing of video games, there's so much more we can learn. That specific example is from a video game called Virginia, where you play as um, it is a newly hired FBI agent who is tasked with internally investigating another person, female, who just happens to be the only one in the precinct. <laughs> and the game itself is based on a true story. So in my classroom, I have students take on the role of Ann Tarver and play live in front of 271 students with mics unlocked. And oftentimes, it's the first time that they see hands that don't look like theirs in the mm -hmm. game. That's a conversation. It's the first time you pull up, no spoilers, to a particular gas station and something happens and you realize it's happening as a result of who you are and what you look like, mm -hmm. and we talk about that. But then the students have to go and build video games based on their own experiences, and that, to me, is the true power of the medium, storytelling. We keep talking about inclusion. How about teaching students how to build that inclusion themselves? Very, very interesting. All right, Julia, you founded the organization Shoelace Learning, which combines gaming, psychology, and development to provide game-based learning solutions. I'm hoping you can break down the difference here between gamification and game-based learning. Sure, I think we see a lot of gamification in learning. So that might be a learning program that uses badges, rewards, currencies to help kids get motivated. Game-based learning is different in that you're using the game as the medium to deliver the learning. So it's game first, and the learning is delivered based on triggers that kids run into as they're playing the game. What it does really well is it enhances motivation to do the learning. Um, and that's what we need. You know, I've spent years um, shadowing teachers in schools and and kids are checked out. They're checked out of their learning. And, and then at, in their home environments, they've got super rich mediums that they're engaging with. And we need to meet them where they're at. And so game-based learning is, I still believe it's really emerging. It's I haven't seen a lot of great examples of where it's been done well, um, but I see huge potential uh, in this sector. Jeffrey, you work with many youth and parents who deal with gaming addiction at the center. I'm hoping you can share with us sort of how those conversations begin, but ultimately, how is it that you are helping everyone involved there? Well, uh, let me just say that I certainly agree with Julia when we, when we look at games are not all created equally. 
Uh, and we're looking at gaming as a global area here, but different games have different components to them. Not all are educational. We have first-person shooter games that also create a, a wide variety of problems. But typically, we get calls from parents all the time saying, my child is gaming too much. He's only interested in gaming. He doesn't want to go out and socialize with his friends. He doesn't even want to come up for dinner unless I bring him his dinner because he's so involved in the gaming. And that they have a difficult time getting their children to stop the gaming and doing other activities, whether they be educational activities, social activities, recreational activities. And uh, while it's really important, and both Chris and Julia mentioned the importance of parents in this, parents are frustrated. They don't know what to do. Uh, and when they start setting limits and their children don't adhere to those limits, they throw their hands up and they give up and they say, you know, there's no point in doing this anymore because all we're doing is fighting. But this is becoming a major problem. It's difficult for parents to identify the amount of time their children will be gaming because we don't know what the adverse consequences are. So children who want to game more on the weekends are fine. If they're gaming to the uh, detriment of their academic work or their socialization, this is a problem. Julia, how can we promote responsible gaming? Well, you know, I think it starts really young, right? I, you know, as a parent, again, parent of four, I've seen it. When kids have an iPad for a while they, and you try to take it away, you get extremely bad behavior and you have to be disciplined. You just, you have to make sure that you're disciplined with your kids at a super early age and teaching this digital responsibility at an early age is what sets them up for the future. And it's no different. It's just like eating healthy. You know, you, you really want your kids to understand that early so that they can, uh, you know, employ those <laughs> techniques later in life and, and be healthy. Um, I also think just thinking of the design of these games is so important. Making sure that you're inspiring positive behaviors. One of the beautiful things about gaming is that it, it gives you a space for positive failure, right? It builds confidence. Kids are struggling with confidence these days because there aren't many spaces where there's positive failure. And so I think really identifying the ways that games can be successful in building strong, capable, confident, young people is is kind of the first step and then building you know around that to make sure that we're being thoughtful and deliberate in our design of video games for kids and then we have to be responsible it's our responsibility as adults as educators to make sure that we're putting the good games in front of kids so that we are building future generations who who are capable of uh, of doing what we need them to do <laughs> which is to think critically uh, to have confidence uh, and to to want to participate so that's Chris, I do want to get your take on that, only because I feel like you are in that 1% who probably, when we call you the professor of video games, you play a lot of video games. And this is something that you've done as a kid, as a youth, and you still do today. How do you balance th these conversations and promote responsible gaming while also indulging in, in, in the beauty that is video games? Excellent question. So I've been playing an average of two to four video games since the age of eight. And as the age of 14, I had said to my parents, I just want to play video games all day, every day. And my parents said to me, absolutely, as long as you pay for it. Hmm. Uh oh, and then I had to find hmm. my first job. And that was at a local restaurant. Couldn't wait until I was 16, but they empowered me with the idea of, if you want to do something, you're going to pay for it. You want to play online? Oh, guess who's paying for the internet? So this was my empowerment, and now that's what I teach my daughters. When they're interested in something, how are we gonna do this? But the biggest strength is teaching people to build. When I wanted to play online games via a computer, I had to build it. So I learned how to build a computer, and that's part of what I'm doing now, trying to teach kids how to build and provide for themselves and to help support themselves, because there was no situation where I could have said to my parents, I want, and then finish the sentence. Everybody needed to work in order to get the things that they wanted to do. So that's my approach, I just talk about how I was raised and how I do it now. All right, I wanna pick up on something that Julia had mentioned in terms of the rich mediums that, uh, that we have, uh, that students have after, after school. And, and one of the things I'm sure parents may not know what it is, but they've heard it is Twitch. You know, it's like, <laughs> what, is, what is this 
you know, platform that my child or is watching hours and hours of programming, watching someone play video games uh, or, or, or so forth. And there's the argument that, you know, you can learn a lot more than just that. Can video games and digital platforms like, like Twitch replace school curriculum and class instructions? Or is there, maybe I'm going too far, but you know, oh no. Okay. Not at all. So uh, in the recent talk, I talk about how Twitch, owned by Amazon, is an online streaming platform where people are known to watch other people play video games, but there are people that are teaching others how to paint, how to play piano, how to cook, and even how to code. And so these are things where you're looking at if in 2019, 2.78 million concurrent viewers were watching, it can't all be entertainment. And so we look in the nuance, you look at the Amazon categories of art, programming, there's science, there are people that are learning how to paint miniatures. And I often bring Twitch into the classroom to show 3D artists, for example, how they can start giving their own superpowers of artistry leverage by connecting with community members. And that's part of the power of Twitch. But on top of that, it's incredibly high production value on Twitch. So the production values that we see on some of these streamers were we to implement that in traditional classroom instruction for a traditional online instruction, promise you engaging would be higher because it looks like what they see when they go home. And as Julia said, meeting them where they are. All right, Julia, I want to get your take on that as well. I might be going a whole stretch here by saying, does, does something like Twitch and other digital platforms slowly replace our educators in, in some platform? Or is it just the platform that changes itself? But can video games and digital platforms uh, sort of replace the curriculum or class instruction. I think today we're in an era where it's in, it's enhancement, it's augmentation um, for teachers. These are tools for teachers to use. Um, I think I believe in teachers deeply uh, as coaches, as motivators. The problem is today they don't have that chance in the classroom to be able to do the teaching, the motivating, the coaching, because they're so busy managing behavior, um, because we're losing our kids. They're just not engaged. Now, do I think we can replace teachers? I, I don't think so. I really hope we continue to have a model where teachers are coaching the kids. Um, but I do see video games evolving to be more transformative in education. We are going to get to a point where we're in immersive environments, where we can actually learn by doing in-game spaces, which is really exciting. We're not quite there yet, and we're going to need very good research-driven design once we get there to make sure we're providing kids with great experiences. But it is possible to have a really different transformative education experience, and we're heading that way. I, I want to stick with you because I want to ask, in, in the ideal world, in the perfect world, where these to what for the longest time was their separate realms, we bring them together. What does that look like in a classroom, in, in the perfect world to you, where we use something like Twitch or another digital platform and we're in a classroom? Well, I don't think you have to be in a classroom. I think we're reinventing what schools look like too. And I think that the idea that we are no longer in a position where we have one person teaching to many, we're in the position now where we can have many teaching to one. And that's one of the things I think is so exceptional about using technology in education is we can help young people broaden their context, really have a huge number of data points from which to start thinking critically, thinking creatively. And we need future generations to have these skills to be able to solve some of the complex problems we have. So I see a very different school of the future, one that uses digital to be able to enhance and transform education uh, and teachers and coaches there to really help kids be, you know, move down that path in ways that they're excited to, to evolve. So I think it's gonna look very different. All right, I want to change gears a little bit. Of course, uh, we are you know, still going through a, the pandemic, and I know that that had really changed the way that we consumed gaming. Uh, Jeffrey, how did the pandemic affect our gaming habits? Well, we know that uh, young people or even older people have played a lot more games during the pandemic. Parents were working from home. Their children were home from school, and parents were trying to focus in what they had to do, and so, in many cases, they often told the kids, if you're finished with your work, go play games, go on your computer, go on your iPhone. And so this has produced a, a whole generation of young people who played a lot longer on their uh, consoles or on their smartphones or on their computers. And as a result, it's now hard to wean them off of this. 
Um, I think it's really important, and uh, both Julia and Chris mentioned that parents have a very important role in this. I don't think most parents really know what their children are playing on their computers or on their smartphones. And so I think it's incumbent upon them to actually look at the games that they're playing. And maybe rather than just shutting off all the games, they could balance those games, some educational, some recreational, some much more enjoyable for the young person. All right, Chris. Uh we saw many students struggling with online learning during COVID. How do we effectively incorporate video games into school and work environment? Of course, as a professor, COVID was probably not kind to you as a, as a professor with students staring at you at a screen on Zoom, just kind of looking at you with blank faces and, and so forth. And I'm, I, I, what I'm trying to get at is I think there is this connection that needs to happen. You had mentioned sort of the, the level of production mm -hmm. that we get when we see gaming and, and how we do that. How do we effectively incorporate those two together? So I actually saw an increase in engagement in my classrooms online because <laughs> my setup mimics that of Twitch streamers because I myself am a Twitch streamer and a YouTuber. <laughs> so I afford the students the ability to add comments live during class which appear on screen over my feed as well as part of my class in teaching game design is running a roulette throughout 270 students and the lucky winner gets to take control of my machine and play the game like Virginia in front of their peers for the first time and dissect it. We have a live Let's Play, which is common on Twitch. We all play together and dissect the game and we ask questions for research. We call that Think Aloud Protocol. So I'm inducing Think Aloud Protocol during my live stream class that's hybrid. And the pandemic has ended and we've returned back to Toronto Metropolitan University in the Red Bull Gaming Hub. I live stream my in-person classes as well because I believe it can and could be a standard hmm. so that students who are familiar with my approach to teaching could stay at home if they wanted to because I'm teaching them how to build video games. Some of them have the computers at home, but those who don't can come into the lab and we're all working along. They can talk to each other back and forth. So I saw it as a huge advantage to show post-secondary education and the world how we can transform education in a way that mimics what our students are used to engaging with. All right, Julia, I want to come back to you because I want to get some sort of real world examples uh, of what you think, uh, whether they're video games, whether there are uh, platforms that really do a good job of mixing both the education side and the video game themselves. They're not your favorite video game, but uh, video games that you think are doing the job or are kind of are getting there. So I think that one of the best examples I've seen and one that we've tried to emulate at, at Shoelace with our games is, is Dreambox. It's a math game, um, very adaptive to each unique learner's abilities, which is beautiful. Again, confidence building, so you don't feel like you're at the bottom of the class. So that's a, that's a great one. Um, there's, there's also a Quebec-based uh, company that's focused on giving teachers the opportunity to build games that they can deliver their assignments with, which is awesome. Um, the way we're doing it at Shoelace is a little bit different. We've built a learning platform with adaptive learning and the ability for teacher to, teachers to deliver um, assignments, but through any mobile game a, a child chooses to play. So we've built it to plug games into, and then we use the game triggers uh, to, be, to inspire the learning content. And I think that's an interesting approach because kids are smart about what they like, you know? So we can't, we can't force feed them um, games necessarily. We wanna give them agency to be able to choose games that suit their, their likes, uh, but in a way that actually enhances their learning. Um, so not a ton of great examples yet. I really do think we're still in kind of the baby phase of game-based learning, um, but new things popping up all the time. Jeffrey. Video games aren't going anywhere. We, we, get, we established that from the conversation. We just established it from the onset. It's a fine line in terms of, you had used the word, uh, an example that, you know, how do we wean off some of our, our youth in, in, in sort of their gaming? But there's a fine line there. Of course, gaming will be there in terms of how it is be, being used. Any advice to parents, to students that you have that you think that they should be taking into account as we move forward in the next five, 10 years? I think uh, Julia's point earlier was that we have to really start when children are very young. And what we really need to do is set limits and also help children maintain those limits in terms of the amount of time and the frequency in which they're gaming, as well as the types of games that they're actually engaged in. Some of the games also have what are referred to as loot boxes, and these actually stimulate 
or simulate gambling. And not only that, but people are telling us that their children are losing lots and lots of money playing these games. All right. Chris, you teach video game design. You wrote a paper on inclusivity of video games. I want to get into that. How could the new generation of game designers shape this industry for the better? So I can give some examples from some of my students this year. There are games about uh, immigration from China that my students are working on. Mm -hmm. There are games about coping with celiac disease that one of my students who has celiac disease is building herself. There are other games about uh, being seen and feelings of being seen, a third person walking simulator with conversation that's being built by another student. There are games about flight. There are games about mystery, magic. The number one way we can include ourselves is to include ourselves. You can build these spaces and there are platforms like Unity, Unreal Engine, and this is what we're teaching among other platforms for you to be able to tell your story. If there's an issue with loot boxes, you can build a game that doesn't have loot boxes. If there's an issue where you don't see yourself reflected, you have the ability to build yourself into the narrative in addition to a narrative that speaks directly to you and others like you. Very, very interesting stuff. Julia, the last question goes to you. What are you most excited about uh, when we look at video games and the future? I'm most excited about educators like Chris. <laughs> <laughs> most, most excited about the fact that there's a new generation of educators who are who understand the power of being able to motivate kids in a new medium and who are willing to experiment and try new things and and get kids engaged it, it's a beautiful thing to see these teachers work in classrooms and really be the heroes for their kids um, because they they understand that that there's a way to really get them engaged and motivated and yeah chris is just a perfect example of that I'm not going to leave you here blushing. So maybe you get the last, <laughs> the truly last response in terms of you know, what you're excited about. I, thank you, Julia. I can't wait to chat with you after this. Um, I just feel that we have a responsibility to understand and dissect the medium. In my classroom now, we have both men and women programming games. And we talk about, what's this discussion about inclusion? And many of the folk in our class are like, wait a second, I'm being part of the change. To inspire the change is... One of the greatest honors I'll ever have as an educator, but now is the time. All right, we are going to leave it there. Chris, <laughs> Julia, Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Really, really great stuff. Thank you. It's great. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.